can do anything you want. I ain't got no problem with it. I promise you that shit. Listen to the words. He, 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 he. Garbage. A joke. Clown axe. Pisses me off. No. Come find no. me. No. 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 He. No. Come find me. Listen to the words. He. Come find he. me. He. 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 Garbage. A joke. Clown axe. Pisses me off. I ain't a hard guy to find. I promise you that shit. He. Listen to the word. Garbage. A joke. Clown axe. Pisses me off. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? It is a Tuesday night, which for the first time in a long time means we're bringing you nothing but rants, or as we like to call it around here, MBR, the show where I bring you topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them, like this one right here. So, um, I don't know if you saw this weekend, um, but there was a little bit of what I like to call cancel culture turning out to pay dividends for the first time. And I'm gonna, it's, it's always good if we get, you know, bad people off of a platform or whatever. But cancel culture brought us something that, in my opinion, paid some dividends this weekend. If you weren't paying attention, whilst Vladimir Putin was, you know, invading Ukraine on his way to committing some war crimes, Grambling State thought it was a great time for the world's biggest news dump. I mean, in, in the history of news dumps, this will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Literally, while some people are worried about friggin' World War III breaking out, Grambling State and Hugh Jackson's like, hey, oh, by the way, remember that Art Browse guy? He's pretty good at offense coordinating. We're, we're going to bring him on as OC. Is, is that okay, everyone? Is that okay? Just slide that in on a late Friday afternoon. For those of you who don't know, who aren't initiated, who is Art Browse? Well, you know, some of friends of mine, a.k.a. the Dan Levitard Show, like to call him the devil. Um, and he is. And if you don't know, which I was surprised paying attention to the uh, the Discord channel today, our our, our, our family, our, our, our chat room or whatever you have, have it for our patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. We were talking about it just before the show. We had a couple of people like, well, who is Art Browse? What is Art Browse big for? Because, you know, Baylor football, despite, you know, Robert Griffin III winning a Heisman, nobody really cared for a really long time. So, a lot of people don't really remember what happened. Let me surmise it for you. Let me summarize the Art Browse experience out there at Baylor in one quick paragraph. This paragraph coming via the report initially that ultimately led to investigations out there at Baylor. And I quote, the choices made by football staff and athletic leaderships in some instances posed a risk to campus safety and the integrity of the university. In certain interested instances, rather, including reports of sexual assault by multiple football players, athletics and football personnel affirmatively chose not to report sexual violence and dating violence to an appropriate administrator outside of athletics. What does that mean? Well, what that means is basically whilst out there at Baylor, um, Art Browse, the CEO of the football program, decided it behooved him and it was the be it was to the betterment of the interest of the program to not really report and not really do his job in terms of a leader when it comes to reporting sexual misconduct and in this case, sexual assaults. B baseline, he essentially covered up a couple of rapes. Um, and Grambling State thought after a couple of years of coaching D2 football and spending some time over in Europe, actually, did Art Bryles, and growing his hair out and doing the mullet thing, um, they thought it was a good idea to sneak him in and announce him as the offensive coordinator on Friday. Okay? So social media grabs hold of it. By the time Saturday rolls around, the entire sports world looked up and said, uh, uh-uh, nah, we, we ain't about to have this one, Hugh Jackson. So... By, by Friday, announced OC. By Saturday, the whole social media burns down. Get our brows back to hell where he belongs. Um, and by Sunday, our brows already stepped down. And, you know, Hugh Jackson basically on social media implicated, him, implicated himself in tax evasion. I don't know if you saw this, but he commented on his own charitable foundation. And within his own replies of his own charitable foundation, he basically publicly admitted to tax invasion. So, it's been an absolute world whirling dervish out there uh, at Grambling State from $25,000 base salaries, essentially in NIL, to hiring Hugh Jackson, to try to hiring Art Browse, to Art Browse having to step down basically just to save Hugh Jackson's job. 
to Hugh Jackson maybe not getting a coach anyways because apparently he admitted to tax evasion. So it was a hell of a time to be alive and be on social media when it comes to college football this past weekend because some old, old skeletons in the closet were rehashed. Um, and again, I, I don't I, I want people to be able to rehab their image and all that good stuff and come back out here and, and have a second chance, you know, like serve your time, do your time, whatever. He didn't even have to serve time. You get what I'm saying? I believe in second chances, maybe not for this one, okay? Maybe not for this guy who, by the way, still has active investigations and active pending lawsuits for covering up sexual assaults whilst on Baylor's campus. That guy can't work for current colleges. He can't, okay? And he damn sure shouldn't be able to walk around with a no, without a no-cause order, okay? Uh, a show-cause order, rather. I, I like to make fun of Dan Mullen as much as the next guy. That guy's got a show cause order for the next four years or something crazy stuff like that because his own athletic director turned him in for hosting some recruits when he wasn't supposed to. This guy was covering up sexual assaults and it's out here being able to coach college football. Cancel culture did the right thing here, man. You, you can't have this around college football. I, I know there's not much sanctity left in this sport. I understand that it's becoming a professional organization. I understand all those things. P players are getting paid, all that good stuff. That is not a reason or an excuse for us to be sacrificing morals out here. Why? Because because he runs a good offense? Nah, nonsense. Get that out of here. I'm glad what happened this last weekend happened. Um, you know, just Art Browse. Can't can't be doing it. Um, and that goes for the rest of that loaded superstar roster of coaches that were out there at Baylor doing what they were doing. Okay. Kendall Browse, mm-hmm. I'm looking at you. Uh, you know, Jeff Levy, mm-hmm. I'm looking at you out there at Oklahoma. So that there was a lot of people involved in that that still got jobs that still hold high ranking official or high ranking positions at a lot of college football programs across the country. And I'm just saying, if if we got to show up and say, hey, I cheated because I hosted a couple of extra kids when I wasn't supposed to, then by God, you should have to show up and let your entire fan base know that, hey, this guy that we hired as OC, his last job, he might have been covering up sexual assaults because football players were good. You know, like, just, I, it's a rant. I know I'm on my high horse, but that, that kind of stuff just can't have it. All right. Um, we got a loaded show for you guys today, but before we let you know what we're going to talk about, we got to show love to the sponsor, our friends, our partners, our family over there at Gramco. Get your mind right with Gramco Delta 8 products today. From gummies to wake and bake coffee, the company has something for everyone, including disposable vapes. Coming in a nice pre-packaged, product i mean it's, it's it's primo stuff comes right out of the box and runs tr uh, tremendously Sh shipping is quick and discreet as well as easy products are hemp derived and all start with gramco's own plants know your source save 25 percent today with promo code brooks 25 over at the gramco.com the link is in the description of this video However, wherever you found us today, whether it be over on YouTube, whether it be over on Facebook, whether it be on Twitter, uh, show us some support in the variety of ways on those platforms. I believe it's a thumbs up over on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button as well. Send some hearts flying on Twitter, Periscope, and Facebook. Feel free to share the broadcast wherever you feel free or feel need feel the need to do so um i will also tell you that we do have a podcast platform so if you miss any portion of today's broadcast you can either rewatch it over on youtube or if you want to catch us on your drive into work tomorrow morning it'll be up for you available siri be tripping uh available over on all your podcast platforms appreciate you guys for being here today we got a loaded show for you we're going to give you our thoughts on the stacy searles hire um it is searles by the way i was where I, I didn't quite understand the pronunciation but I should have known deep south Searles, all right? Just rolls off the tongue real deep like Searles, just like that. Stacey Searles, I will give you our thoughts on that, um, a little bit of intel and behind the scenes on that decision. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how Dan Lanning just might do all right out there at Oregon, believe it or not. Um, and I, I want to get nostalgic for a little bit with some of the greatest games uh, since the 2000s. It's the offseason. Sometimes we want to get a little, you know, it's been great to watch college football over these last 22 years. Let's talk a little bit about it since the 2000s, since the new millennium, I believe is what it's called. So we'll talk about those at some point during tonight's show. But I do want to get started with the primary topic of the day, the reason you're all here, which is the Stacey Searles hire. Um, hire. 
I just got real country after pronouncing that Searles name. Uh, but yeah, been hired to uh, be the new offensive line coach at the University of Georgia. Let me just, before I give you thoughts and opinions, I'm just going to give you what I like to call Brooks read, Reads the Wiki. Okay, Brooks did his research and read the Wikipedia. So let me read the Wikipedia for you, as Ted Mosby, Mosby would say. All right, so starting in 2003, where he joins the LSU staff uh, from 03 to 06, that's the first time he crosses paths with Will Muschamp. He'll cross paths again briefly out there in Texas. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Then he comes to Georgia from 2007 to 2010, works with Mark Rick and, of course, Mike Bobo as the offensive coordinator, he being the offensive line coach during those three years. Then he goes out to Texas from 11 to 13 um, with Mac Brown and kind of finishes off the run that Mac Brown has out there at Texas. By the way, did some research. Manny Diaz and Brian Harson were both on that staff out there at Texas. So these names that have been circling college football, they've been circling college football for a decade which kind of is the point of tonight's rant, if you will. Um, but And then he's in uh, – Searles is from – at Vatek from 14 to 15. After the Mac Brown regime ends, he waits it out and finishes out with Frank Beamer. Frank Beamer ultimately retires, and, and they leave the regime up there in Hokey Land. And then he goes down there into Miami. His buddy Mark Ricks hires – Mark Rick hires him again, and they rode that one out until Mark Rick was eventually fired in 2018. And then he went back to Mac uh, – Mac Brown up there at UNC from 19 to 21. What do I tell you all that to tell you? I mean, why are you giving me all these rundowns? Why are you reading the Wikipedia, Brooks? Um, what do you gather from all that information? And I, I'll tell you, man, this is a dude, first of all, that's been a part of some regime enders, man. There's, there's no other way to put this, okay? End of regime and end of run out there in Texas with Mac Brown. I mean, rides it out with Frank Beamer up there at Virginia Tech. They get canned or asked to retire, okay? So, yep, coached the last game of Mark Rick, rode that one out, regime ended. And I don't know, but he was up there at UNC, and I'm just going to let you know in what appears to be Mac Brown's first and last stop as a head football coach, he kind of left him out to dry as well, just dipping out on him after giving up 82 sacks in two seasons, 49 in the last year alone. Okay, so... Those are kind of daunting things. The idea and the 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 facts that this dude, the last three stops, four stops really, has kind of just cut the end of it, right? Cut the end of the regime there. Um, the second thing I gather from that last, I don't know, five, six, seven stops of this dude's coaching career is he spent the last decade being hired by his buddies to be their offensive line coach. I mean, that, that's what it is. Mac Brown twice. Okay, Mark Rick twice. Frank Beamer. So we, we got a bunch of friends on the list, and, and that's great, okay? So he, that, that also tells me he must be tremendous to work with. I mean, absolutely tremendous to work with. You won't hear a coach say a bad word about this joker because they keep hiring him. Everyone that's ever coached with him continues to hire him, uh, continues to hire him at their next stop and their next stop and their next stop. But I also know a little something about football coaches, as you would imagine, right? The film got known a little bit something about football coaches, if you will recall. I did have five offensive line coaches in high school. I know what these guys are, okay? I know what these guys are. I know what the history of the coaching profession looks like. And I'll tell you this much. Like a lot of industries, okay, the coaching industry is one where you climb the ladder, all right? You climb that ladder all the way up to the pinnacle or what it is the top rung of your ladder looks like over time, okay? It is a slow progression. It is not a quick one. It is a grind from bottom to top. Okay, just like every other industry when it comes to the elites of the elites. Okay, however, this industry is a little bit different than most because in the coaching industry, we don't just climb one ladder. Okay, you're climbing all over the place. You're climbing at App State. You're climbing at Tennessee Tech. You're climbing at uh, Georgia State. And then you're going out to Kansas to get a first big time power five job. And then you're going out to Temple, right? Because you took a step down and you're doing this all the way up the ladder. And once you get to the very top that it is that you have reached, that your uh, you know, destiny is as a coach, once you reach the pinnacle of that ladder, nine times out of 10, you trickle your way all the way back down, right? You start out in high school, you start out as a graduate assistant, you start out, you start out, you start out, right? And you climb. And you jump around and you jump around and you jump around and then you reach whatever your pinnacle looks like and then you fall all the way back down. And it takes about 40 years to go from top or from bottom to top to top to bottom, right? That's normally 
the progression of this coaching ladder. So let's take a look at Searles' ladder, right? In 1994, also known as the year of the film guy, shouts to 94 babies, um, he, was the, he was the offensive line coach at App State. First Division I job, first big-time position coaching job in 1994. He spent six years out there in Boone, North Carolina, and in 2000, he heads up to Cincy. That's a rung up, right? He spends three years at Cincy, and then he's at LSU. That's a big jump and a big leap up. We're really climbing the ladder quickly. He spends three or four years out there, wins a national title with Nick Saban and that coach, Steph, and then boom, in 2007, he's all the way up there at Georgia, right? And then in 2010, he goes to Texas. Now, look, I'm not here to argue whether Texas is the pinnacle or Georgia is the pinnacle. I'm telling you, in 2010, with the way and in, in the world in which college football was and the landscape that was college football, Texas is certainly the pinnacle of this dude's coaching career all the way back in 2010, okay? That's the pinnacle of the ladder, folks. He reached the top of it. He started in 94 at App State, and by 2010, he's damn near making a million dollars or whatever Texas was paying all the way back there as the head offensive line coach under the Mac Brown regime. He had reached it, gotten all the way there. And then guess what? You, you guessed it. We start tickling back down that ladder. We start trickling down that ladder, right? We go from Texas to Va Tech. Okay, Vatek to North Carolina, North Carolina, or excuse me, uh, Vatek to Miami, Miami to North Carolina. Boys, we are, we are slowly but surely going back down that ladder, right? We are doing what every other coach has done and fall back down that ladder. And then suddenly, thank God we made friends with Mike Bobo. Thank God we made friends with Will Muschamp. Thank God Kirby Smart listens to those two dudes because now all of a sudden, after a decade, of falling right back down the same ladder that we spent 25 years climbing back up, we start falling down. And somebody throws us a life raft, and all of a sudden we're back on the pinnacle of the sport at the University of Georgia as the offensive line coach. I'm here to tell you that this is not traditional. This is not normal. This hire is not standard, okay? This hire and the career chart or the career chart and, and, and the, uh, the uh, trajectory of Mr. Searles was not to be back at Georgia. Okay, after North Carolina, after giving up 82 sacks in two seasons, after giving up 49 sacks in one season, the story arc of nine out of 10 coaches does not end up back at the pinnacle of the position. It does not. Matter of fact, it ends up falling right back down, right? It goes from UNC to now you might be coaching at Furman. Most of the time, if you do stuff like this, very, very rarely do we see somebody on that downward trend just jump back up to the top of the ladder, okay? So say what you want about coaching off the line at Georgia. Say what you want about how it's a dream job. You got all the Jimmys and the Joes. You got a stable full of beef boys, okay? You got a stable full of dudes that you can go out there and coach. How it's the easy, how it'd be the easiest recruiting job or one of the easiest recruiting jobs of all time, right? But I'm here to tell you, Mateos out there at Baylor used you as a raise opportunity or what looks like. He used you as a, a raise opportunity. Atkins down there at FSU kind of looked like he did the same. He's getting OC duties but didn't get his raise until after he flirted with taking the O-line job at Georgia. He got paid now. Um, Ellerby up there at Tennessee, you flirted with him at Georgia per my sources, but he wasn't either really interested in taking the job or dying to take the job. So here we are with Stacey Searles. I'm here to tell you he was not the first candidate. He was probably not the second candidate, but – all that being said, I'll tell you this much. This dude has an absolute way about him in terms of the Southern charm, okay? You can say that's caveat. You can say that's bull crap. You can say it doesn't matter, Brooks. What do we do? Are we blocking run, blocking well? Are we pass blocking well? We'll get to that. I'm telling you that he's going to recruit well because he gets this area. He's definitely going to get these kids. He's going to understand all of these uh, situations when it comes to recruiting. He's going to recruit really well because everybody with a G on their chest recruits well, okay? Fran Brown, going to recruit at the highest level he's ever recruited in his life, okay? Uzo Deribe, same damn thing. That dude was recruiting at Kansas 12 months ago. You think he's in heaven or what? Okay, same thing for Searles. Searles is back here. He knows what Georgia recruiting is like, but now he doesn't. Now he's about to experience what it's like under Kirby Smart, which is a different animal. So he's going to have dudes. He's always going to have dudes. Okay. It's almost impossible to be bad at this job currently. Okay. His players love him. Coaches speak extremely high or highly of him. 
and this is an extremely, extremely safe hire, okay? Even if it's a stopgap for the next young guy, okay? Even if Searles is here for 18 months, stabilizes the room, keeps everybody happy enough for you to turn it back over for the next guy, then you win. Then that's a dub, man. That's a dub right there. And it was, again, it was la it was last-minute notice. Yeah, I mean, you had a month. I mean, you literally had basically like 15 days to figure out this hire after Matt Luke uh, stepped away and, and, and stepped down. So all things considered, the fact that most other programs are preparing for spring ball, you pulled Searles right before spring ball, by the way. UNC's out there practicing right now with no offensive line coach. So it could be much, much worse, all right? I don't think this is necessarily a terrible hire, but I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, this is a great hire. No, this is a retread. This is comfort. This is, yeah, it's a stopgap. That's what that is for me, in my opinion. And guess what? Just because I don't like it or I'm not fond of it or I would have liked to seen them do something a little bit more innovative, like maybe promote Eddie Gordon, I don't know, an offensive line assistant that's been in the building that knows your players, that is comfortable with your players, that your players, according to my people, really, really enjoy. Okay, a guy that's been there for quite a while being your offensive line assistant. I don't know. You're going to lose the guy to a job at, at – uh you know, Mississippi State in the next, like, I don't maybe 12 months. So why not just give him a run? I, maybe that's the goal. Maybe that's the mission. Maybe Searles is here to give him a little bit more seasoning before they give it to him. But, man, I would have liked to see them do something different. But who am I? I'm a guy sitting here on a YouTube studio or a YouTube, uh, you know, page giving opinions for the last 25 minutes. So I don't know much more than you guys, except I didn't really love what I saw on tape. But I also didn't love what the offense coordinator was doing up there in North Carolina. Thought a lot of the the stuff that leads to sacks could have been explained or could have been changed or will be changed under Munkin. Georgia gave up, I think, the top three. I think they were top three in the nation in sacks allowed. That wasn't because they've got five first-rounders up front. No. It's because they got a really, really good offense coordinator. They had a mobile quarterback, and they designed plays to move the pocket over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. So he'll be fine, okay? I don't think you're going to show up, uh, you know, week one against Oregon and just have blow-throughs running all through the holes. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's a guy that's been coaching for 30-some-odd years and probably is going to bring some stability to the room. And most importantly, this is a player's coach. Not that Luke wasn't, but this isn't a yell-at-you-scream-at-you guy. The last one was, okay? Both methods work. This method is different. And if you're going to replace somebody and you did and you liked the last one, okay, but maybe he wore out his welcome a little bit, then go find someone that does things a lot differently, right? Bring them to the room and maybe things will change a little bit. Now, as far as what will this mean to the offensive line room, I'm here to tell you that you were going to have attrition in that room anyways, okay? You got a lot of dudes that are backlogged on that roster that haven't received PT in a long, long time. So you're going to get some guys that leave that roster. I would imagine. All right. We've got a couple more segments left, but I do want to take another shout to our sponsor. Did you know that Gramco has ties to the University of Georgia? I know, right? Can you believe that? We're out here with a, a, a keynote sponsor that loves the dogs. That's right. It's Gramco.com, and they're veteran-owned, so you can both support the dogs and support the troops. How about them apples? All right. Support the company that supports this platform right here by ordering online today and saving 25% off by using promo code Brooks25. Shipping is quick and discreet at the gramco.com. The link is in the bio. Seriously, guys, um, those folks treat us really, really well. Um, and they are what kind of provides outside of my extreme work ethic um, and ability for my wife to let me work like I do. Um, but these guys, are the one these guys are the ones that you know create all this and allow all this to happen. Um, any type of meetups that we're potentially going to plan very very soon, they'll be the key driving factors behind that. So only that that stuff only happens though if you guys are as crazy about your support for them as you are for us. Um, that's the Gramco.com promo code Brooks again, and you'll save twenty five Brooks twenty five rather, and you'll save twenty five percent off. Let's get a little nostalgic, shall we? Um, this is a, this is gonna be a quick segment. It's gonna be an even quicker show than normal. Um, we only got two segments left guys. So I know you guys are enjoying tonight's show. I'm enjoying you guys being here. Hey, 
That's a nice number of folks here right now. Nice. Um, but no, uh, got let's get some nostalgia going right here. Um, I like to talk football. You guys know this. I like to talk to you guys about football. And every once in a while, I like to look back and go, dang. Y'all remember that game? That game was pretty cool, huh? And since we're not around the campfire right now, I'm just in my studio and you're at home or in the car or wherever you're listening. Um, let's try to get nostalgic together. So as I talk about these things, you guys just, you know, have a mental picture there with you and we'll both go, dang, this is a good game. This is going to be a terrible segment. We'll give it a shot. ESPN released an article yesterday about the top 60 games uh, in the last 20 one season so since 2000 essentially um and sure enough there's one two three four games in the top 10 alone um that involve the georgia bulldogs most of which actually all of which you took the l in oh no three of which you took the l in but that's okay we'll talk about them anyways um number one and i don't disagree with this on the espn's list because i remember where i was i remember what it meant to me um, as a young college football fan. And that's the 2006 Rose Bowl, a.k.a. the 2005 National Championship between the Texas Longhorns and the USC Trojans. Um, at that point, USC had won 34 straight games. Texas had won thir- or 19 straight. So these two teams had gone 50, what's that, 53 games? 53 games in a row, neither of them had lost. You had Reggie Bush, you had Matt Leiner, you had Vince Young, um, you had Mike Williams. I mean, it was an onslaught of football talent all over the field. Um, And for me, it was everything that was right about my childhood in terms of college football and what it meant. Number two is obviously um, another Rose Bowl, which was the UGA and Oklahoma Rose Bowl out there in 2017 on your way to another game that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And it's no coincidence to me that the number one and number two games on this list are Rose Bowl games. And to me, it's a shame that moving forward, it's a a fraud, okay, if I can go any further. It's a fraud, it's a shame, it's a crime to all of college football humanity. And that's the fact that the Rose Bowl from now on will forever be just the Rose Bowl. They've removed it from all of playoff contention rotation. They've left it as the Rose Bowl, which means for the rest of time, we are stuck watching Big Ten and Pac-12 football in the Rose Bowl. And I'm sorry, but that's some dog water stuff. I would rather actually watch, you know, the two best games we've seen in my lifetime that were created because they had stakes. They weren't just a Pac-12, Big Ten, you know, jamboree, okay, with a big parade in front of it. That's not what they were, okay? Texas and USC is massive because it had implications, and it was a great game. Okay, Georgia and Oklahoma was a massive game because it had massive implications and it was a great game. You know what isn't in the top 10 on this list? Penn State and Wisconsin or Penn State and whoever they played out there in that four OT game. Okay. When uh the receiver, I forget his name, receiver uh Goodwin went off for 250 yards and Trace McSorley threw for 500 and Sam Darnold, USC, was out there and they were battling out. You guys don't remember that. You might because you might have caught it late. But these Rose Bowl games will never be again. We won't have them until they put them back in the national title rotation, which I think is a crime shame. Um, Number four on this list is the prayer at Jordan Hare. Uh, Funny story, actually, here. A little story time with Brooks, as if all of this isn't just for me to tell you things. Um, So back in, I think it was 2014. I think it was 2014, right? Because Auburn went on to kick six two weeks later and then go on to lose to FSU in the national title game um there against Jameis Winston and the boys um but anyways I remember this game because actually it was our bye week my sophomore year of college and bye weeks when you're a football player a D2 football player in in particular you go find out what real football looks like and what it means to actually play football and not just like scrimmage against other teams which is what d2 football sometimes feels like in comparison so we go down to auburn my brother's actually playing baseball at auburn at the time so we had a place to stay and my buddies growing up shout out to john knight and ethan uh ethan school they live by this motto and i still to this day think they do but basically just like if you act like you belong you do belong so if you just carry yourself like you're supposed to be there people will believe you so about half about half an hour maybe an hour before the game my buddy Ethan Sewell looks at me and goes, hey, man, let's just walk in there. We don't have tickets, but let's just walk in there. We'll, we'll be all right, right? Let's just walk in there. 
I said, you sure? He's like, yeah, just act like you've been there. Act like you're supposed to be there. Don't make eye contact with anybody. Just keep your head up and walk. I was like, all right. Walked right in. Swear to God. Right in, set on the 50-yard line, five rows up the entire first half. Okay, the entire first half. And then somebody comes down, typical Auburn folks showing up late, um, you know, booster folks. Show up late, come down, and they kick us out of our seats. That's fine. We go walk all the way up to the the top of the stadium in Jordan-Hare, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but that sucker's built like you're down, looking down on the field, even at the very top. We're standing on the back wall. May have consumed some drinks all day long at this point. It's a night game out there at Auburn, so we're exhausted. My buddy looks at me and goes, Hey, man, I'm pretty miserable. You just want to go. I think Georgia was down like two or three scores at that time. Then they come back in that football game. Anyways, so we leave one of the best games in college football history that we got into for free. One of the worst mistakes I've ever made in my life. We have to watch the game and the reaction, the subsequent reaction from a tailgate of a buddy of ours down at the end of the uh, whatever main street that they have right there. So, yes. I and a friend of mine snuck into one of the greatest football games in the history of college football, and we left right after halftime because our feet hurt and we're a little too coming down off of a day-long binge drinking. Um, Not something I'm proud of, to be honest with you, but something I felt like I needed to share. It's the whole reason we had this segment, so I can tell you a story. Um, Number eight on the list, second and 26. Number nine on the list, the 2020-12, the 2012 SEC Championship game. Neither of which you feel like me recapping, so we're not going to do it. Um, yeah, some some great college football games that have come out of the last, what, 23 years, 22 years of college football, and I would imagine we're only going to get more moving forward. I, I think we had some really, really good football games this year. Uh, the Iron Bowl is always great. The national title game, despite the fact that it ended in, what, a 15-point win, that game was tight late. My, I mean – I had no skin in the game, but my buck, my butthole was puckered. Okay, I was a little nervous the entire game just because a lot of stakes, a lot of pressure on the on the line. Some really, really good football games. I mean, Clemson game this year, start the football game, or for start the football season, that was a, a an old-school slobber knocker, okay? No, no offensive touchdown scored and somehow was still a really appeasing game and appealing game visually. So um, I, th- I think college football is is in the right, headed in the right direction. And we're only going to get more of these games that mean a lot to us in the college football world moving forward. All right, last segment of the night um, for you guys, and it is about Dan Lanning, who I think is going to do a pretty good job out there at Oregon. Not a pretty good job. I think he's going to do a really, really good job out there at Oregon. Um, but let's take a second. While we got some people, new people rolling in here. Hit that thumbs up button for me, man. I don't know what the metrics look like over there on YouTube right now, but I guarantee you we got more people watching than we do thumbs up on the show. So if you could, please show us some love. Feel free to do that. If you're listening to us on a podcast right now, first of all, shouts to you. Um, and if you're unaware that we have a podcast, we do. Just search the Film Guy Network, wherever, however you get your podcast. While you're there, subscribe, rate, and review. Re- unsubscribe, resubscribe, re-rate, re-review. Okay? Do all that good stuff for me while you're there. Um, let's get into this Dan Lanning stuff, man. Uh, you know, all great leaders aren't just great motivators. Okay. What what do you mean by that, Brooks? You're out here talking nonsense. What do you mean by that? All great leaders. Okay. All great leaders aren't just great motivators. Okay. They aren't just great communicators. They aren't just great hard workers. Okay. Great hard workers, a little bit repetitive. They aren't just hard workers. They're almost always, almost always, 99.9% of the time, when we're talking about great coaches, okay, the greatest of great coaches, almost always, they're tremendous influencers, okay? What is recruiting? What, what, is, what is recruiting? Think about it. It's influencing someone into making the decision to come play for you, right? It's getting all these factors creating all of these reasons as to why someone should come do something for you or come play for you, and then influencing them to ultimately making that decision and deciding to come play for you, okay? What does it mean to get your players to buy in, okay? We talk about coaches saying all the time, we got to get guys to buy in. We got to get guys to buy in. We got to get guys to buy in. What the hell does that mean, okay? How do you do it? Well, you got to influence, okay? You got you to influence your players into believing that placing the team above, above themselves 
is the correct decision, okay? Great influencers. That's what great leaders do, especially when we're talking about a large body of people. You got to be able to get them pointed in the same direction. You have to influence them into going into the same direction. What does all that mean about Dan Lanning? Well, when you're a complete outsider to the world of Oregon Ducks football, okay, if you're a guy from the Midwest who spent your formative years as a football coach hanging around in the Southeast, you're going to have a lot of convincing to do when you go all the way up there to Eugene and take a coaching interview, okay? First of all, Oregon is one of these places that for decades, okay, for decades, only hired Oregon guys, okay? These are guys that had been around the program, had had a cup of coffee in the program, you know, offensive line coach, OC, then one day spent some time in another place, came back, been the head coach, okay? That's what they were known for. Guys that were comfortable with the program, guys that were aware of the program, guys that had been around the program. Those were the types of dudes they were hiring for decades. That's how it'd been. And then they kind of stepped out of that box, right? Kind of got out of their comfort zone, went out there and hired Willie Taggart. Didn't really work for him. Willie Taggart left for a job that he really wanted, which is Florida State. Same thing happened to Mario Cristobal, the guy they ultimately replaced him with. Mario Cristobal loved the Oregon job. Recruited at a top five level for three straight seasons. Number one recruiting ranking classes three years in a row out there at the Pac-12. Believe he won a Pac-12 championship. Lost another one to Utah after getting smacked around for two weeks in a row, um, or two games in a row, rather, because he was a little bit busy taking the Miami job. But nonetheless, okay, those two out-of-the-box hires, non-Oregon guy hires, they didn't really end well for the University of Oregon. In fact, Oregon got left at the altar by two guys that left what I would deem lesser to be or to coach at lesser programs, okay? Florida State doesn't have the resources or, you know, the the path to a national title like Oregon does. Not even close. Willie Taggart had a special place in his heart for someplace other than Eugene, Oregon. Miami, maybe. Maybe now. Especially Cristobal having the background uh, and being a Miami guy, a South Florida guy. Maybe that's a better place than Oregon. But I could make the argument that they're on par. In fact, I would probably take the Oregon job considering all of the fact that, you know, NIL is going to be a pretty big deal. And he just walked away from Phil Knight, the guy that invented Nike, by the way, um, who I, I would imagine is going to be a player in this NIL stuff very, very soon. Kayvon Thibodeau got a six-figure deal this year with Nike while he's out there. So I think it was a little bit silly to walk away. But nonetheless, this is a program that over the last two regimes of head coaches has looked up and said, why do we keep getting left for the uglier girl? What in the hell's going on? Why why do we keep getting our boyfriend swept away? What what's going on here? And you know what? I'm done with it. We're going back to the old way. Screw all this. Go hire the young new assistant. Screw all this. Go find the high, the next uh, a young and up uh, up and coming guy. Screw all that. We're going back to Oregon guys. That was the vibe when Cristobal did what he did. And then within a week, what happens? Within a week, Dan Lanning convinces the booster base convinces the decision makers, convinces all the best uh, former players, convinces then the uh, after that the current players, okay, that he's the guy. That despite the fact that these other two really hot girls left them, okay, for other men, left them, I switched the analogy now, left them out to the dry hanging at the altar, we're still going to go after what appears on the surface level to be the same kind of caliber of dude. A guy that hadn't really proved it at the Power 5 level as a head coach, but seems to be young, energetic, and understand recruiting at an SEC or at least a premium national level. Yeah, those three guys are kind of identical. But Lanning, despite all of the, 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 the animosity towards outsiders towards this program, convinced an entire body, an entire fan base, an entire booster base that he's the guy, that he's the guy. You know what that is? That sheer people skills that sheer relationship skills, and that sheer influence, dog. And those are attributes to a great football coach. Absolutely 100%. So I think he's got a shot, okay? I do. I think Lanning's got a shot to be really, really good out there at Oregon. And with the way the rest of the, the Pac-12 is kind of situated, it's two dogs eating out there. It's USC and Oregon, okay? Now, USC, it wasn't. Okay, I would say that Oregon job was probably a little bit easier when Crystal Ball was there than it now is. That Lincoln Riley's down there in Southern California. But guess what? There's three three quarters of California that you can recruit, bro. Okay, the entire Northwest is all yours. 
I guarantee you he gets active in the Samoan population out there at Utah, okay? That's how Utah has been as good as they are. Go watch that front seven, both sides of the ball, okay? Mm-hmm. Them some big boys out there, um, and eventually Lanning will get things turned around. That don't mean it's going to look all that good and together come week one against the University of Georgia, but I do think Dan gets those boys up and ready to play. I appreciate you guys for being here tonight. I appreciate Gramco for supporting the broadcast. Again, the Gramco.com promo code Brooks25 will save you 25% off over there. I've got a Devontae Wyatt film study for Patreon coming up tomorrow morning. We've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. It's time to grind that mo- tape. So we're going to get after that tomorrow. Appreciate you guys for being here. Like that uh, show. Subscribe to that thing as your way out. See you next time.